And uh, so I began to uh, dive into the Word, and, and I was looking at and reading through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We're all familiar with the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And so I want you to turn to that. We're not going to look as so much in uh, chapter 5. We're very familiar with that particular chapter with the Beatitudes and uh, blessed are ye who hunger and thirst after righteousness and thus like. And then uh, the part about let your light so shine uh, before men. We, we know about that. But I began to dive into chapter 6 and 7 and I came up with 10 things to keep in mind in 2022. We are in a new year. This is the first Wednesday of our new year. And I thought, well, I'll just... Uh, Instead of doing a topical sermon or a normal type sermon or lesson tonight, we would just look at these 10 things uh, and that I found in, in uh, these two chapters. And so we're going to read the bulk of chapter 6 and chapter 7 as we go through this. So just hang on, have your Bibles ready. Uh, also, it should be on the screen or it will be on the screen for you to see as well. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started tonight. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the blessings of today. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to stand behind this pulpit to uh, proclaim your word. And God, I pray, Lord, that we will take these 10 things seriously tonight and that it will help us, Lord, as we journey through our life. Lord, with you by our side and with you as the head of, of our life. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that uh, you'll be at the sick. I pray, Lord, that you'll uh, protect them. I pray, Lord, you'll keep the rest who are not sick from getting sick. And I pray for those that have had heart issues and those that have had surgeries. And uh, Lord, I just pray for blessings to be upon them. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you do not have a list, I do have a list back there for you of these 10 things, and we're going to go through these. I actually call these the core values of our life. That's the kind of the thought that I had as it came to me this morning. And these are teachings from Jesus himself uh, from the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe when Jesus teaches us something, we ought to listen, right? It ought to be something that we pay close attention to and certainly things that we need to keep in mind. And the first one is this, do the right things for the right reasons. Now, my dad and my mother were very strong on their sons doing the right thing. Now, if I didn't do the right thing, there were consequences. But they also taught me that I need to do the right thing for the right reasons. And that's the reason why I penned it like this. Uh, because when I look at Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 8, I note that there were some people doing some things that seemed right and that were right, but they were doing it to be seen. They were doing it for the wrong reason. And let's look at these in uh, Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 1 through 8. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. And can you imagine that? Drawing attention to themselves so that people will see what they were giving to as a charitable deed. And they would blow the trumpet. And in other Gospels, we find that um, they would actually, when they were putting money in, they had this uh, device that was kind of round like this, and they would throw that money in, and it would clang, and it would make noise all the way down uh, the funnel of that tube just to draw attention. Something that was right, but it was done for the wrong reason. But here they were blowing trumpets, and uh, Jesus called them hypocrites in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And then he switches from charitable deeds to praying. He says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, folks, it's, it's the right thing to do to pray, right? But if you're drawing attention to yourself, that right thing becomes a wrong thing. 
We need to draw glory to God in our prayers. But you, he says, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Where is the Father? He is going to meet you right there in your closet, in your secret place. What a special place that is. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. In other words, it's not how many words you say, it's what you say. And it's how you say it. And we need to pray in the will of God, and we need to pray to the glory of God. Therefore, do not be like them. In other words, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't give just to be seen. Don't pray just to be heard by men. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So folks, keep in mind in 2022 to do the right things, and let's do it for the right reason. And that's for the glory and the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about prayer, because I believe it's important that we understand we need to pray God's agenda, not our own agendas. In other words, we need to pray God's will to be done. Not only pray God's will to be done, but we need to pray in God's will. And the Bible tells us that many times we ask amiss because we do not pray in the will of God. But here in verse 9 through 13, we've, we, uh, we uh, hear it to, or, or it's known to us as the Lord's Prayer. I, I like it to, uh, to say that it's the model prayer, uh, the disciple prayer, because uh, they asked him to teach them to pray. And he said this in verse 9, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you pray, do you understand that God is holy? Do you? We need to understand how holy He is and how sinful we are. And when we go to praying, we need to first confess our sins before Him in order us to have the ear of God and for us to be in a proper position, a proper place to listen to God. Amen? So He said, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is perfect, folks. We understand that, right? And uh, he wants us to be in the center of his will. And I think that one of the great things we can do is to pray in the will of God. He says, give us this day our daily bread. How many of you realize that he provides for you? I know we pray for, for our needs to be met. Well, he says here, give us this day our daily bread. It's not a weekly thing or a monthly thing. It's a daily thing. And we need to be thankful for the provision of the Lord. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation. Folks, God doesn't lead us into temptation, right? Now, the devil does. And the devil and his army will, will tempt us every single day of our life. And we need to make sure that we are prayed up and uh, we are praying in the will of God and that will help us to stay out of temptation. But deliver us from the evil one for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Folks, we need to pray God's agenda. And I hope that uh, I hope you understand that. We need to keep that in mind as we uh, go on through our, our life's journey. The third thing is this. And you'll notice three and four on the board if you're writing these things down or if you want to add anything to, to the sheet. Relationships will make or break you. Now, I have noticed this in all of my ministry, uh, 41 years of ministry, uh, watching relationships. The greatest relationship that you can have is the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Right? But you know what? We go through life and we have relationships with other human beings. We have relationships with our spouses. We have relationships with our kids, our grandkids, our, our church brothers and sisters. We have relationships. And so down here on earth, those relationships could, uh, could be hurt. And I want to 
I'm going to read two verses to you tonight that you've heard many, many times before. But I want you to listen. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want to ask you, how many of you have a forgiveness problem? I want to tell you this. God does not have a forgiveness problem. Okay? God wants to forgive. God wants to cleanse. But sometimes as human beings, we have a forgiveness problem. Sometimes there's somebody that has hurt us and they have hurt us deeply and it's hard for us to, to let that go. It's hard for us to forgive that. It's hard for us to forget that. But God says here, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses... Neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Folks, that's the words of Jesus. And I have counseled with numerous people over the 41 years of ministry that have dealt, that have struggled with this, about uh, letting go of something and forgiving someone. But I've also seen where people have let it go and given it to God and made it right with another person. And I want to tell you, the happiness and the joy that returns to that individual is amazing. But if you want to live a bitter life, if you want to live a life that's hindered, just go ahead and live in an unforgiving spirit. But I don't think you want to be that way, do you? And in 2022, we need to understand that relationships can make it or break us. And within those relationships, there needs to be forgiveness. Number four... It's very important. As I was looking at this, I began to think about what's important, what's more important. Well, folks, eternal things are more important than the temporal things in which we see each and every day. So we need to prioritize eternal things, not the temporal things. And if you look with me in verse 19, it says here, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what is it that you treasure? Is it the things that you amass here on this earth? Is it the things that you gather? Is it the things that uh, bring popularity to you? Is it things that draw attention to you? What, what is it? All of the things of this life are temporary, but the things of God are eternal. And you notice there it said that we can lay up treasures on earth and they'll be destroyed, but we can lay treasure in heaven where neither rust nor moth nor thieves can break in and destroy. It goes on to say in verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, dark, if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And then here's that popular verse, no man or no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I think of the word mammon, and I think of, obviously, we think of money. But I think that it's just talking about all kinds of things, the things of life. Folks, we can't, we can't serve God and at the same time serve the things of this life. So prioritize eternal things, not the temporal. Number five says this, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> how many of you, uh, and, and I really don't want you raising your hand, but how many of you would class yourself as a worrier? Anybody? I think we all would be guilty of it at some point in our life. But he says here that we don't have to sweat the small stuff. 
And when we read down through here, beginning uh, in verse number 25, you're going to see uh, that he's talking about life. He's talking about food. He's talking about clothing. He's talking about all of these things. He said, I'm going to provide those things for you. You don't have to sweat that. And he says here, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. And Brother Don, I remember you saying yesterday in our prayer time that worry is kind of like sitting in a rocking chair. You just you rock and rock and rock, but you go nowhere. And that's really what worry is. Therefore, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he gives us an illustration. Look at the birds of the air. And I've often wondered, you know, how nature makes it through the cold that we've been having and how nature makes it, period. But you realize that nature, animals and the things of nature, do you realize they obey and do exactly what God intended them to do? I think that's a good lesson for us that we as humans need to obey. And we'll get to that on our, on our last one here tonight. But he said, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. In other words, they don't go out and work and, and plow and make uh, all the food, but they, they get fed. He said here, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubic to his stature? <laughs> and I've often wondered. I'm 5'11 and three quarters. And I told my wife when I, we got married, I was six foot tall. I've always wanted to be six foot, but I'm 5'11 and three quarters. And I know I can't add anything to, to that, so why do I worry about it, right? <laughs> That's just a side note. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They, na they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, here we go again, do not, what? Oh, thank you. The two people that said that, I appreciate it. Do not worry. There you go. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Now look at verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I don't know about tomorrow, but I do know who holds tomorrow. You know, there's, that's, a, that's a wonderful song. Uh, I don't know about, Brother Nick, you probably have sang that over many, many times in your life. Um, what a great song. So folks, don't sweat the small stuff. But number six is important. God's kingdom is paramount. Seek it first. Look at verse 32. For after all these things... The Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Hey, we need the clothing, we need the food, we need the lodging, we need all those things. But there's something much more important. Verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. And here's the key. And His righteousness. How many of you, uh, I mean, you hunger and you thirst for righteousness? I mean, God wants us to do that. We are to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And then it says, and then in context of all this, and all these things shall be added unto you. So God's kingdom is paramount. It's so important. It's so vital to your life. Well, let me get a little more personal now as we look at verse at number 7. And that is this. Judge yourself before you judge others. You ever catch yourself judging people? Come on now. I'm not the only one that does that. I think we need to be careful of this. I think sometimes we even try to justify things and we say, well, we're not like that person and I'm not like this person. And really what we're doing, we're, we're, we're making a judgment. Well, we need to leave that 
to the Lord, do we not? Chapter 7, verse 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Well, I tell you, Jesus is getting personal here. And I'm sure as he was sitting there and the disciples were listening to this and the crowd, the multitude that had gathered listening to this, they began to wonder, well, really, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about take a look at yourself and quit looking at other people. Are we not all sinners, folks? Are we not all born sinners? And you know what? I believe sin is sin in the eyes of God. And I think if we become critical and we become judgmental of other people, uh, that's a sin we need to confess and get right uh, before the Lord. Look at verse 4. Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite! <laughs> I, love the, I love how Jesus, how he conveyed his, his heart and his, his mind. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under, your, under their feet and turn and tear you into pieces. So, folks, it's important that we examine ourselves and let God take care of everybody else. Right? So judge yourself before you judge others. Number eight, if you need something, ask. And if you have something... Give it away. I got to thinking about that in, in 1 Corinthians. It's uh, God loves a cheerful giver. And he's talking about there not just money. He's talking about giving of your time, of your service, uh, giving of yourself and how important that is. But here in verse uh, 7, 7 through 12, let's note, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, you'll give him a stone? Now, I don't believe anyone in this room today would do that. Somebody needed something, you wouldn't, if they needed food, you wouldn't give them a rock to eat. Or he goes on, if he asked for a fish, you wouldn't give him a serpent. I don't like snakes, so I wouldn't touch one anyway. I've often wondered about that story about Moses, and he cast down the rod, and it turned into a serpent, and God said, pick it up. I, I, I know Moses had to say, God, you pick it up. I'm not picking it up. But he went ahead and picked it up, and it turned back to the rod. But if someone asks for fish, some food, you wouldn't give them something that would harm them you would give them the best that you had, right? That's what God would want us to do. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Oh, I'm so thankful we have a Father like that. All we got to do is ask, and we'll receive. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. I've noticed this. Any time that I am compelled to give something to someone, God always gives it back. Now that should not be our motive as to why we give, but isn't God good to, to do that? And um, I, I'll be honest with you, in the 38 years of marriage, I've never, ever, ever had a bill that has come due that I didn't have funds to pay it. Sometimes I, it was coming right down to the very, very day that it was due. But folks, God has always come through. Always. And I know that that is in reference to tithing, and tithing is very important. And God wants us to give of the substance in which we earn. And God, I believe, He commands us to do that, to give our tithes and our offerings. But folks, there's so many other areas that we can give. 
Uh, and our food, our food bank does that. Our uh, our body as a, as a church, we we give uh, we give vital things to people when they need it, and it's just so important and so valuable. Well, number nine, almost out of time already. Stay true to your convictions. Don't wander from the narrow path. Now notice this in uh, verse thirteen: Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, when Jesus was saying this on that, that day, it was very easily understood. They were uh, people that would grow crops and grow fruit all the time. So he was using things that would really uh, bring it to life to them. And so they were understanding exactly what he was saying. Verse 18, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, bad fruit nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. What about your convictions? What about the things, the precepts, the statutes, the things you've learned from the Word of God? Do you hang on to those? You have asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart. You have gone that narrow way as he has talked about here. He said few that few that is there to find it. And so when we ask Jesus to come into our heart and he comes in and he saves us, then we have a life that we are to live for him. And there are some things, there are some vi valuable core values that, and convictions that we must abide by. And we find them in the Word of God. Now I don't have time to go through those tonight. You know what, what God wants you to do. You know what the will of God is for you as a Christian. And so follow those convictions. And then the last thing as I, as I conclude this tonight, obedience to God is the only sure foundation for life. I hope that you practice obedience. When I did not practice obedience growing up as a child, I really paid for it. He was called a whipping. And my dad and mom believed in that. And um, they took care of all four of us that way. But you know, obedience to your parents is, is vital and it's very important, but obedience to God is much more important and much more vital in your life. Let's read verse 21 on. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I think within that lawlessness, you can use the term disobedience. Therefore, he said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, there's obedience, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, that would be disobedience, right? Will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And then that chapter ends, and so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. Now, I'm not a teacher like Jesus is, but you need to be astonished at the things he wants you to do. You need to be mindful. 
And keep in mind all of the, and there's, there's more we could, we could glean out of that if we had the time tonight. But take these and, and use them in your life in 2022 and keep them in mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can come together and worship and just uh, hear, your, hear the words that were your heart and hear, hear those red letters, Lord, that uh, we find in the word. So, God, I pray, Lord, that we will take these and, Lord, we will apply them to our life. And, uh, Lord, it will help us as we live uh, our journey each day. Uh, Lord, again, be with those that are sick and those that are hurting. In Jesus' name, amen.